Um, but it, it took 16 years to get here. You're, you're running, you're trying to forget that it ever happened. Yeah. Um, the trauma started to seep into other areas of my life. So I threw myself in a, in a therapy, which I highly recommend if you have the resources, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. in this country, you know, mental health is not always at the top of the list. Um, Evan Rachel Wood uses a combination of impersonal distancing language and shallow buzzwords. This combination can be explained away by the claim that she's still traumatized or that she's not allowed to say anything specific. In her interview with The View, which I've analyzed in this video, she went into quite a lot of detail about the music video she was in, which allegedly caused her trauma. I couldn't even include the words she used. And certainly, no prosecutor is going to buy that trauma explains her verbal behavior. Because since she was strong enough to make the allegations, she should be strong enough to substantiate and prove them. I'll continue analyzing her unreliable statements, as any prosecutor would or should. Don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to the channel. And let us all know what you think about this interview in the comments below. First of all, I find it strange that media not only give a platform to accusers, but also side with them. The sympathetic title of this video is Surviving Trauma and Speaking Out, as if she's in fact a survivor, and more importantly, that we all know what this trauma is. With their inbuilt presuppositions, it's well documented that titles and headlines affect our views on news. If we see them enough times, we start to think of something as an established fact, even though this isn't necessarily the case. And we must always remember that allegations are just that, allegations. It doesn't matter who makes them or how they make us feel, they mean nothing before they've been tested in court. The first relevant concept is pronoun shift. Pronouns are intuitive, they're one of the first things we learn. What's yours, what's mine, what's his, what's hers, etc. Thus, a shift in pronoun marks a shift in thinking pattern. It matters if a person uses the personal pronoun I, taking ownership of the experiences they're describing, or uses the distancing and general pronoun you, associating with other people. It shows us how they think in the moment. Notice what's changed from I to you. You indicates general victim language that's not specific to Wood. Uh, I do get a lot of people commenting on how I'm able to speak about things and put on a brave face and, and, and how strong I am. Um, but it, it took 16 years to get here. And, and the first thing that I did when I got out was try to get as far away from it as possible. Try to forget it ever happened. You're, you're, you're running. You're trying to forget that it ever happened. Yeah. Um, she manages to maintain the I up until saying that she tried to get as far away from it as possible, which anticipates the objection that it's strange she waited so long to come forward. She then shifts to you, making her stated reason seem more acceptable or normal. You're, you're, you're running. You're trying to forget that it ever happened. Yeah. People use associating language because they don't want it to seem like they're alone in feeling or thinking something. And this point is particularly important to Wood. Um, and then, of course, it catches up with you. And uh, I, I couldn't run from it. It started, the trauma started to seep into other areas of my life. So I threw myself in a, in a therapy, which I highly recommend if you have the resources. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. in this country, you know, mental health is not always at the top of the list. Um, and, and really, I, I, I was planning on taking this to my grave. I really was wow. not planning on saying anything ever. I, I was that afraid. And of, then, course, of course, course it implies shared you. knowledge. This kind of language draws the conclusions for the audience that it's supposedly understandable that it catches up with you. Trauma, unfortunately, has become a buzzword. Many people who aren't actually traumatized will use it as part of their sympathy strategy. When you mention certain popular words, many people will automatically think that they know what you mean and empathize with you. It's a real word describing real struggles that some people go through. Unfortunately, today with social media, it's hard to know who's a victim and who's pretending to be one for attention, validation, and evasion of responsibility. She says she threw herself into therapy, which she highly recommends if you have the resources, even though mental health isn't always at the top of the list. She's supposed to tell her personal story, but keeps inserting generic points 
first the pronoun you, and now this somewhat strange encouragement to seek help. But then again, it's probably not that strange. Because her intention is to persuade people, she has to tap into the feelings and values that they have. And mental health is a popular talking point. It's also a way of postponing her personal story, which she obviously has a problem telling in a straightforward fashion. She uses the context-specific adverb really two really, times. I really Here, was... while shaking her head no, she says that she really was planning on not saying anything. This is a persuasive use of the adverb, which implies that she knows that some people doubt her story and or motives. She could have just said, I was planning on not saying anything, but she adds the adverb. That's how we know persuasions involved. And persuasion implies a high level of self-awareness, that what she's saying is to a large extent rehearsed and as such intentional. In the following, notice how she repeats the same things we've already established. 1. Swift shift from talking about herself to associating with other victims. And 2. Buzzwords in order to appeal to people's emotions. This time, words like safe, alone and the only one. Um, and that afraid of retaliation, I just did not feel safe and I felt very alone. I thought I was the only one. And you'll hear that a lot from, from survivors. She says you'll hear these words a lot from survivors, another buzzword by the way, and I believe her. I believe she's read and heard a lot about what survivors say, but this isn't to her benefit. Instead it points to the possibility that she's using stories from actual survivors for personal validation. Again, she's persuading, and persuasion is manipulative by default, whether or not a person's telling the truth. She's more focused on being believed than actually telling the things that would make people believe her. She's impatiently drawing the conclusions. Next, we should note her pauses, hesitation markers in form of interjections, and restarts, all signifying that she's uncomfortable with answering the question. Let's hear the question first. Why did you feel it necessary to say, hey, this person is also going through things? Why, why do that knowing that it would then you know, almost cloud some people's judgment in like who's guilty or who's not, or even, even who's accountable sometimes. This is Trevor Noah's polite way to correctly suggest that there's still doubt as to who's accountable for what. On a surface level, he's merely asking a question, but on a deeper level, looking at the question's implications, it's dangerous for Wood, and she also treats it as dangerous. Watch this long and extremely evasive answer, postponing the specific answer for as long as possible. Of course, and, and, and that's, uh, it, it can definitely get, get complicated in, in that way because I, I do believe in accountability and healing and, and reform and I think there is a, a, a time and a, and a space for that and I think we need to leave more space for accountability otherwise nobody's going to be accountable. Right. Um, but uh, I, I just knew we're never going to get to the root of this problem if, if, if we don't go into the background um, and, and the root and the cause is, is the root of so many issues in, uh, in, in this country, in the world. It bleeds into almost every area of society and we don't even realize it. Um, it's, it, 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 is a, it is a cycle. Um, and uh, there are people that can stop the cycle. Um, and there are some people, I feel, like Brian, that don't want help. And he's had every opportunity. He's had so many people try. Mm -hmm. um, and he has is, he is refused it every time. Um, and uh, It took her one minute to get to the specific case. She spent the first 58 or 59 seconds giving generic, even awkward statements. It, she says, it can, it can definitely, definitely get, get complicated, complicated in, in, that, in way, that way, acknowledging Noah's question, but notably not in relation to her specifically. It can definitely get complicated is a general formulation that could be applied to any victim situation. I, Next, I she strangely makes herself an advocate for accountability, and, and healing and reform. Words without substance, at least not a substance she cares to define. She says she believes in these things, but who doesn't believe in these things? Also, believe is a strange verb, since a concept like accountability doesn't require you to believe in it. It exists without belief. Thus, this is virtue signaling. 
Her association I, I, I with other people continues. It, she it, now it, uses the pronoun we, making this a collective problem for the whole country, or the whole world even. Still, it's only very superficially related to Noah's specific question. Once, I mean, I don't know how much I can say, but there, you know, there, there have been allegations and uh, stories that have come out on the, on the internet. I, I have to draw the line there. Um, and uh, I don't believe that he will stop until he is stopped. And sometimes the greatest act of love is stopping that person from hurting themselves or hurting anybody else. If we're to look at this critically, I mean, I what uses say, her appeals to limitations and what she can say as a shield, as a way of not having to go into specifics? Specifics are harder to make up and they're more committal. This isn't a consistent pattern though. As I mentioned in the intro, she went into specifics about the music video in her interview with The View, and she's certainly gone into specifics before that. So it seems like she's using the appeal to limitations when she sees fit. Here, she can use the appeal to explain away why her answers seem so reluctant and unconvincing. Also, it's unexpected that she would suddenly care about Warner's well-being when she's done everything in her love. power to damage his well-being. Thus, speaking in terms of the greatest act of love in this context is highly unreliable virtue signaling. Her language is designed to portray her in a positive light. But how a person wants to be perceived can be very different from how they are actually perceived. Amber Heard learned this the hard way. Heard's performance in court also taught us to be aware of quick mood changes. And trauma until I realized I could do something with it. I'm not a saint. I'm not trying to present myself as one, as you all know. But I selfishly found relief in being able to use what I've lived through to advocate for others. But I now, as I stand here today, can't have a career, and I can't so do my charity work. Sustain the objection. Yes, that's effectively what happened. Yeah. But your own witness, your former best friend Rocky Pennington, she didn't corroborate that, did she? Uh, I'm not quite sure what part of that night she saw. There were a lot of people there. You testified that once you brought Mr. Depp back to your trailer, he trashed it. Correct? That is correct. And the manager of the Hicksville trailer park was furious that Johnny had wrecked the whole thing. Do you remember that testimony? That's correct. And mood change is the next thing to notice in the interview. Notice the pause Wood makes before repeating trauma, the buzzwords she dwells on and hence wants us to focus on. This pause coupled with a deliberate half-hearted smile signifies that she's supposedly in an emotional state of mind. But then notice how fast she shifts to a different, assertive tone when she starts referring to studies that have been done. People underestimate the, the power of that kind of trauma and what it does to your body and to your brain. And there's so many studies to back this up. And, and this is what the laws do not reflect, is the effects of trauma on the brain. And a lot of people when they think they know how they're going to respond to a situation like that. But until you're in a life-threatening situation and you're doing risk assessment and you're in survival mode and you're going to have that fight, flight, or freeze response, sometimes all three, um, you're just trying to survive that moment and get the least amount of damage, you know? And uh, This is the most condescending part of the interview, where she's not only instructing people on in how to think and react to her claims, but it's also implicitly saying that it's wrong for them to have a different opinion until they've been in a similar situation themselves. I say condescending because it's a bad tactic to directly or indirectly discredit, even ridicule other people's thoughts. Also, mode, it's one and a half and decades since she's been in this so-called fight, flight or free ways. situation. What sounds more plausible is that the current trend with accusing powerful people was her incentive to tell this story. Not because it took her this exact number of years to work on her emotions and then she just happened to speak out loud in a climate full of allegations. As an expression you know is you taken know. for granted, as many people use it without thinking much about it. In statement analysis, though, we take note of it, as it's used to imply shared knowledge that the other speaker, in this case Noah, knows what she's talking about, knows that she's telling the truth, which she doesn't. Once again, this demonstrates self-awareness, which then again demonstrates that she's not invested in telling her supposed personal story, but invested in persuading. 
In the following, notice Wood's continuing association and her almost constant references to things she's read, seen or heard, demonstrating that she knows how victims behave. She's directing our attention to what she wants us to believe. And then once you're out, again, like I said, you, you, your, your body and your brain do backflips to protect you from the pain. Mm. And, and, and that's how denial comes into play. That's how, you know, addiction comes into play, bad mm -hmm. coping mechanisms, because you're just trying to bury, because to, to, to face it, to, to face the reality is, is, is almost unbearable. I think on average, it takes people seven to 10 years to be able to process, understand, heal, and be able to put things in chronological order. She uses dramatic pathos in this self-repair. Because to, to, to face it, to, to face the reality. She defends herself by appealing to what she claims is the normal amount of time for people to come to terms with what happened to them. In Stephen Tolman's rather remarkable argument model, this is called backing. Backing is used to support the warrant. The warrant is how someone gets from the grounds to the claim. It's the premise you have to buy in order to believe the claim. However, it could and should be asserted that the backing is weak, that just because this amount of time might be the average, it doesn't follow from that that this is true in each specific instance, including hers. Furthermore, if this is the average, she's way above it. She's almost desperately trying to make the macro level, victims in general, fit the micro level, her story. But there's no necessary connection between the two levels. A necessary connection between two entities is known as causation. She's smart enough to know this. Thus, this is persuasion, trying to get us to see things her way. The laws, I mean, you know, in California, the statute of limitations was one to three years when we started uh, advocating for the Phoenix Act. And, you know, <laughs> One to three years yeah, is no nothing yeah. to a survivor or, or to somebody that has experienced not just one incidence of trauma, which is, you know, any act of trauma is, is terrible, but, you know, imagine 24-7 for four years. Saying that imagine it went on 24-7 for, for four years. years is by definition a hyperbole, as it's not strictly speaking possible. For obvious reasons, hyperbolic language isn't the best strategy when trying to convince people that the truth's on your side. She and, says that you know, one to three years is nothing for a survivor, yeah, nothing not for me. Not only is this associating persuasive and thus manipulative language, but the impersonal nature of it is also noteworthy. And I say that because she shifts between making personal and general statements as she sees fit. And as the next passage shows, it's not because she's too traumatized to talk about the more than a decade old events. In this passage, she's specific about Warner's personality traits, alleged personality traits. The damage that that would do on somebody's psyche and self-esteem. Right. And um, with somebody like him, who is very calculated in brainwashing, in, in isolation, um, it, 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 it very much operates like a cult in that when you're in it, you can't see the forest for the, through mm -hmm. the trees. Mm -hmm. Up is down, down is up. It's, it's you two against the world, and it is a secret that nobody will ever be able to understand. Oof. And you feel like you're a part of something, you know? Um, and you gotta, you gotta break free of that illusion. I found the analogy she's using on psychology today, describing what awful marriages or relationships and calls have in common, coupled with how self-aware she is, giving clues about things she's read and seen. It's very likely that she's also seen this quite common analogy somewhere even though she presents it as something she's come up with. Also, the constant impersonal language points back to the accountability question that was so difficult for her to answer. Taking accountability seems to be something she struggles with. Lastly, we see her covering her mouth. People unconsciously hide their mouths when they're either being deceptive or extremely self-aware for whatever reason. It's a small but noteworthy point. The last part of this interview is a copy of what she said in her interview with The View. It's as if she's reading from a script. Watch this. And, and it, it, it takes time. It takes time and work and therapy. I cannot stress that enough. Um, but you know, again, I, 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 I have those resources. I have a platform. I have privilege. So it really breaks my heart to think of people that don't have access to the things that I've had access to and, and how alone they must feel. And that really is what, what drives me compared to this. 
I have a platform. I'm I'm privileged. I'm 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 white. I have resources, you know, and like I can't even imagine how alone people must feel that go through this that do not have privilege, that do not have a platform, that do not have money, and they're they're alone. They're so alone. And so um or they or they feel like they are. And, she and says that other people who don't really have her kind of platform what, what drive her. But she doesn't just say drives me. She prefaces it with the adverb really, detracting from this claim, implying that she knows there are other things that could potentially be driving her, like attention and money, or just plain old regret and as a consequence, revenge. More than half of the people watching this channel have still not clicked the subscribe button. Luckily, mistakes are made to be fixed, so subscribe if you're interested in videos like this. Thanks for stopping by.